So good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the uh, the last uh, colloquium of uh, uh, Hellas uh, for uh, the year. Uh, my name is Kostas Tassis, and on behalf of the Governing Council, I would like to uh, introduce our uh, speaker today, uh, who is Thoma Dr. Thomas Bisbas. Uh, Dr. Bisbas obtained his uh, uh, bachelor's degree in physics uh, from the Aristotle University of Thessaloniki. Uh, we have this one in common. Uh, then he uh, moved on to his graduate studies in the UK, uh, where he obtained his PhD from the University of Cardiff in 2010. Uh, since then, he has been uh, a postdoctoral researcher in several institutes, uh, including the, uh, the uh, uh, Czech Academy of Sciences, uh, the UCL in London, uh, MPE uh, in Garching, uh, the University of Florida in the US, uh, and after a brief stand in, at the uh, observatory in Athens, uh, he's currently a, a DFG fellow at the University of uh, Cologne. Uh, his, research, his research interests uh, include computational astrophysics and uh, astrochemistry of the interstellar medium, uh, where he's, uh, he's a well-known expert. And today he will tell us about uh, the carbon cycle emission as a diagnostic tool for uh, the uh, state of the interstellar medium. Uh, Thomas, uh, mm -hmm. the, the stage is yours. Yeah, thanks Kostas. Hi everybody. Um, so uh, today we'll uh, talk to you. Uh, I'll, I'll give you some results from my um, around 10 year uh, research on uh, PDRs on photo dissociation regions uh, and we will of course see what uh, these PDRs are and uh, in general I will talk about um, how we use the uh, emission of the carbon cycle which is either in ionized form which is uh, the ionized carbon C plus or atomic, which is the atomic carbon or molecular in the form of uh, CO and how we can use these lines uh, with the observatories in order to understand the interstellar medium, both the environmental parameters, for instance, how much UV radiation is there or how strong are uh, the cosmic ionization rate. Um, and uh, we'll also see how we can use this in order to obtain the molecular mass of the interstellar medium. So as an introduction, uh, let's see, let's take uh, things from the very, very uh, beginning. So. Uh, we have the life cycle of the interstellar medium. You can start from any place you want, and uh, you will end up in in this. Uh, uh, you will end up doing rounds in this uh, wheel of uh, the interstellar medium uh, uh, process. So, for instance, we can start from the ionized uh, case, then uh, the ionized cools down. If we have the formation of the uh, atomic. Uh, uh, regions, and then we have uh, gravitational collapse, we have uh, condensation of material where we have the shielding of the UV radiation, therefore the medium, the medium cools down, and then uh, further process, uh, processes um, uh, form stars, and if, the, if these uh, stars are massive enough, they start emitting radiation, ionizing radiation, so they, they again uh, ionize the material around it, um, maybe then we have uh, we may have uh, supernova explosions, and therefore uh, we have the production of more uh, ionizing radiation, cosmic ionization rate, of course, uh, etc. We end up uh, again in the uh, ionized gas, and this will uh, um, and this process uh, evolves uh, all um, on and on again. Um, of course, in uh, during this each, each process, uh, we have. Um, the opportunity to investigate it by using the diagnostics of the uh, carbon cycle. For instance, the C plus or the C2, as you, as, as you see here, may be used for the identification of the ionized medium. The atomic and the um, carbon and CO can be used for, uh, to trace the molecular gas, uh, CO for star formation and so on. And we will see with different examples what we can do with these uh, tracers, so these uh, different lines. Uh, of course, we are interested in, um, we're interested 
we are interested in doing this because uh, ultimately we want to see how star formation evolves as a, a function of the cosmological redshift, how star formation uh, happens um, through the, uh, um, the epoch of the universe, so the, through the age of the universe. And we know from observations that at around the redshift of around two, we have the peak of uh, the molecular mass density in the universe, as well as the uh, star formation uh, rates um, that, 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 uh, that peaks at uh, around this redshift. So at the redshift of, of two, when the universe was just three giga years old, we have a sudden production of, uh, sudden formation of stars, which is the uh, peak of star formation uh, activity uh, in the universe. And of course, it's uh, an area of interest, especially now with ALMA, because we are now uh, privileged to have a very strong, a very powerful instruments to uh, see uh, the, the galaxies at uh, this high redshift and resolve these galaxies and see also um, the different uh, ISM states of these galaxies and how stars are formed in different environments. Um, and uh, the key to do this is to understand what PDRs are. So PDR stands for, stands for the photodissociation regions. People also tend to call them photo-dominated regions. I prefer personally to call them photo-dissociation regions. Um, and uh, here we have an example of the Orion bar. Uh, this is uh, a, a review here, which you can, I, I recommend you to go through if you are interested in the PDRs by Hollenbach and Tillens, 1999. Although it's written a few years ago, it's still up to date with a very good uh, material in. So the uh, actual PDRs start when the, uh, the, when the radiation the, from stars with the photons lose enough energy to, to go below 13.6 electrovolts in energy, so, uh, but not lower than 6 electrovolts. So whenever the energy of the photons is between 6 and 13.6, we define this as a PDR. If it is more than 13.6, then this is an ionizing, uh, an ionized medium. And if it is less than 6, then it's cold and, um, and molecular and other chemistry takes place there, especially on dust grains. Um, and uh, here I have an example where we have the radiation coming from this direction here. Uh, it loses energy. Then we have the uh, PAH, which stands for polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. We have the emission of this, which is actually dust. Then we have, uh, um, in, this, uh, in these observations, we have uh, emission uh, from warm molecular gas. And you see that, uh, that here we have the H2. Then it disappears because the energy uh, drops further, the temperature goes down, and therefore we can't see H2 anymore. But what we see is the CO uh, 1 to 0 transition. The uh, transition, the, the um, frequency that comes from uh, the um, carbon in this molecular phase, which is locked to uh, is, is locked up with, uh, with oxygen. So what we see here is the stratification of species. So PDS are actually exactly this. There are, there are regions where we expect to have some stratification of species. And if we want to break this down, we have this figure here where the x-axis is the what we call the visual extinction or the AV. But um, uh, if, you, if uh, you're not familiar with AV, if you if you think about it, if you think that this is the column density, then that's all it is. It's actually the AV is the column density times a constant. So the x-axis here or the AV is column density, and the radiation in in this example here comes from left to right. And what you see here is the UV radiation field attenuates as we move further in the clouds. The gas temperature here drops. We go from hot medium to cold medium. And uh, we have the transition, the important transition of the atomic to molecular, the H1 to H2, which is the area of interest. It, it happens at around the FAV of 1. Um, but uh, we also have the uh, different phases of the carbon. So initially, we have C plus, then we have the atomic carbon, and then we have uh, CO. Um, whenever you study PDRs, this is actually the, the picture. This is the certification you expect, and you will not find uh, uh, species uh, in a different order. For example, you will never see CO and H1. 
Uh, but what you will see is that in different regions here, um, these in different environments, these regions are stretched or squeezed. So you may have a, you may have some cases where the C plus is actually extended up to uh, up to high column density CO. Then it's very very uh, small area here. Maybe atomic carbon is also a more extended region, um, and so on. So what? Uh, what we actually um, what actually uh, defines this uh, extent of these regions is the age of the clouds. If the cloud is young enough or old enough, it, if the cloud is young enough, then we expect to have more C plus because it doesn't have time enough to uh, become atomic and then molecular. Um, another thing is the, the starlight or the FUV radiation. So the stronger the FUV radiation, of course, the uh, more extended the H1 and the C plus regions are. Uh, we have cosmic rays. We will see later what the cosmic rays are, which can also do an effect, especially they can um, extend the C1 region. It can go uh, uh, up to high column densities, then we have metallicity effects, and then uh, we have X-ray effects and so on. Uh, there are many different uh, parameters that we have to consider in order to understand the PDRs. What we will see in this presentation is actually uh, some brief examples of, of only those three uh, environmental parameters. The FUV radiation, the cosmic rays, which actually are charged particles and they're responsible to that uh, responsible for the ionization of the interstellar medium um, and the metallicity, of course, which is actually uh, the um, a fraction of uh, uh, of um, metals compared to hydrogen. Of course, as you know, for uh, for um, in astronomy, metal is uh, anything above helium. So um, if we talk about oxygen or carbon, these are metals, and uh, if we have a low metallicity. It means that the abundance of uh, carbon and oxygen are much lower than we expect to find if we, if we were to uh, have uh, observations in the solar neighborhood, for instance. Uh, so uh, lower metallicity environments are uh, especially in the early universe. Um, of course, uh, the question then is how do you observe all these phases? So C plus uh, emits uh, a single, uh, we have a single transition for this. Uh, uh, line, the famous 158 microns. So we know that uh, as long as we have the 158 microns, we know we have all information about uh, C+, which is actually an important ISM coolant. It uh, is responsible for lowering the gas temperature in uh, the uh, environment of the PDR. Uh, it has an ionization potential uh, of 11.2, which is close, close enough to the hydrogen uh, ionization potential. So um, it's actually um, observed both in H2 regions, in uh, environments where we have ionizing radiation, and immediately after. Uh, if we go further, we have the atomic carbon. Here we have not one, but two lines uh, at 609 microns and 317 microns. Another ISM uh, uh, coolant, and as I said, in normal conditions, it is a thin layer. Normal, what I say normal, is in the solar neighborhood or in the Milky Way average, not in the galactic center, but in the uh, outer parts of the Milky Way. So these are what we call the uh, normal conditions. Uh, then we have the CO, which doesn't have one or two transitions, but it can go up to 40 uh, different transitions. And um, um, people tend, uh, I mean, uh, colleagues tend to um, uh, get information not from just one line, but for as many as possible. And they construct this uh, uh, these um, curves here, which we call uh, CO spectral linearity distributions, the well-known SLEDs. Uh, and we'll see later what these are. And each galaxy, for instance, the Milky Way has a, uh, a SLED, which is defined using uh, from, uh, from these observations here. MA82 is different, and you see that there is a very big jump here, especially as we go up to higher J uh, CO transitions, and we will see why this happen, how it can this happen. Uh, of course, we have uh, the oxygen uh, in uh, two lines in 63 and 146 microns. I will not go through the oxygen line, but it is an important coolant in PDRs. So I will only focus on C plus, C1, and CO. Uh, of course, uh, if we want to understand the PDRs, the PDR theory, we uh, have this sim simplified one-dimensional examples, but uh, with the power of uh, having a three-dimensional code and uh, three-dimensional PDR simulations, we can actually see in 3D, in 3D 
how a PDR looks like. So uh, I have here an example from a paper that we have recently published. So I will go through the results later. And uh, what I would like you to see is actually this tube, which is one of my favorite examples of uh, how the PDR looks like. So you see that the outer part of this tube of this filament uh, is actually emitting in C plus. Then uh, we have the C1 at 609, which is one step further inside. So you see C plus and then you go to C1 and then we go to CO. Maybe this uh, filament here is not dense enough to support CO, but we have CO in the higher density medium in this cloud, which we don't have enough C1 and we don't have C plus at all. So you see that when we are in the center of this cloud, which here we have the column density of H1 and H2. So we have this transition here. So as long as we have high column density of H2, we have bright emission of CO, no emission of C plus in this example. Um, so, okay, these are all uh, very good examples. So we have the codes, we have the uh, simulations, but what about observations? So how do we use different observatories for uh, obtaining this line? So um, usually here, um, we, we have some key instruments. Of course, we have many more instruments, but I will just uh, go through the key instruments that uh, the community uses. Uh, here we have uh, two identical uh, uh, panels here. The only difference is that we plot different transitions. So we have the redshift on the x-axis in both cases, and on the y-axis we have the frequency. Um, here we have the ALMA band. So ALMA is the state-of-the-art astrochemical uh, laboratory that we have now uh, in the world. And uh, we have uh, the different ALMA bands that can observe different uh, transitions of uh, CO, which is actually here, the CO different CO uh, ladder, as we call, or the CO sleds. Uh, so you have CO 1 to 0, 2 to 1, 3 to 2, and so on. And um, the important thing to, to keep in mind is that ALMA can only see the CO 1 to 0 for uh, local uh, for only uh, local uh, universe. If we go to higher uh, redshift, so to, so to uh, the distance universe, then uh, ALMA is not good for CO1 to zero, but it's uh, good for higher or uh, mid to high uh, CO uh, transitions. Uh, other instruments um, are um, supporting uh, the frequencies of low uh, JCO lines. JVLA is one of the most famous where uh, we have uh, CO1 to zero uh, um, observations, especially when we are from redshift one and beyond. Uh, so if, if we combine uh, observations from these two uh, instruments, we can start having complete CO uh, sleds. Uh, of course, uh, we have two other lines, uh, which are the atomic carbon lines. You see also that ALMA is very good in, obtain, in observing the atomic carbon uh, line. We have also C+. Uh, C+, um, ALMA can also observe C+, uh, only the higher of the universe. And that's because the, uh, ALMA the C plus line is uh, so high frequency that it is absorbed in the atmosphere. So we have to actually go above the atmosphere, not in space necessarily, but above and uh, or, or the high altitudes. And this is what Sophia is doing. This airplane here, which we have, uh, there is an instrument uh, that uh, observes um, uh, C plus lines in the local universe. And uh, it's actually the only instrument that we have right now to obtain C plus in the local uh, galaxy, in the local uh, systems uh, of Milky Way or nearby galaxies, uh, which uh, also observes uh, in oxygen line simultaneously. We have other instruments like uh, the IRM30 and NOIMA. Uh, these are excellent instruments, uh, alternative, uh, al alternative instruments to ALMA for mid J uh, CO lines and atomic carbon. Uh, we have a forthcoming instrument, the CCAT Prime, which will be dedicated on the atomic carbon line. So we'll have fantastic uh, uh, science uh, coming up with this. And uh, I would like also to keep in mind that uh, uh, although Herschel is gone, uh, we do have a, a very, very rich archive uh, where we can use it to construct complete CO sleds, of course, not only with Herschel, because Herschel used to uh, observe from CO4 to 3 and above, but if we combine Herschel observation with JVLA, we can start having also another uh, rich uh, environment. So we do have a lot of telescopes, a lot of instruments, and now we can uh, we have a huge collection of uh, many, many um, galaxies that we can use for our analysis. Uh, one of the big questions now that we have in uh, 
uh, in uh, ISM is how can we uh, identify and measure the molecular gas in a system, in a galaxy or uh, in, in a cloud. So uh, the problem is that uh, does not emit radiation that is uh, able to be observed by uh, instruments. Of course, in the beginning, I showed a line from H2, but this is the warm line. JWST is a forthcoming telescope that will be dedicated on this. But uh, the H2 that we are primarily interested in is the cold H2 gas, which is the worst star formation takes place. And this does not emit radiation that we can see that or that we will ever be able to see because it's a very, very, very faint. Um, so instead, we, we construct a method uh, to uh, use other key um, uh, observables, especially CO, uh, the CO line, because as I told you earlier, CO, if there is CO, we know that uh, H2 gas exists, uh, that, that, that it is there. So as long as we get uh, the um, um, emission from CO1 to zero, we can convert it to uh, molecular gas mass. And how do, how do we do this? Simply by using this equation. So this integral here is the radio telescope observation, which is given in Kelvin kilometers per second. Um, and then we have to, all we have to do is to multiply with this factor, which we call the X factor or the XCO factor. It is uh, given by this equation here, 2, 10 to the 20. Uh, if you have never seen the XU factor, of course, these uh, units may be funny, uh, may look funny, but they're actually not, because if you multiply this with the radio telescope observation, you will see immediately that Kelvin kilometers per second are gone. So you end up having a column density of molecular hydrogen. And uh, if you assume a size, then you can convert the column density to uh, molecular gas mass. So this is the standard way of... Uh, of um, of using uh, of, of measuring the uh, molecular gas, but uh, as I will show you later, uh, another uh, very promising and powerful um, uh, alternative to CO is uh, the atomic uh, carbon. Not only the atomic carbon, though, um, but also C plus. So, if we go back to the um, uh, to the uh, image that I showed you earlier about this uh, simplified 1D uh, PDR, you will see here that uh, we have a region where we have H2 gas, but we have C plus and some C1. So this does not have CO. We know that, uh, that there are extended regions that do not have uh, CO, uh, uh, that, that, that do not have CO uh, molecules at all. So we call them CO dark, and we have to find, and because these regions may be extended, we have to find an alternative way of measuring this uh, gas. So one of the uh, famous examples was C, uh, because uh, C uh, is a, an excellent tracer where when the gas is around 50 Kelvin or a little bit of, uh, more than 50 Kelvin, up to 100 Kelvin, we, uh, the, the uh, hydrogen can, be, uh, can stay in molecular state uh, at uh, even 100 Kelvin. So we can use C to, uh, to trace this uh, material. So people tend to use, uh, uh, or the groups tend to use either C plus or CO as, uh, as tracers, but uh, they were omitting this uh, one with C1, which uh, they uh, were actually thinking that it, it is a thin layer. Now we are talking about uh, the beliefs uh, that we had like 10 or 20 years ago, uh, that because the C1 is a very thin layer and it's in between C plus and CO, we can't really uh, use this as a, a tracer for molecular gas. Yet, uh, Padelis Papadopoulos, uh, who uh, is a very good friend of mine and, uh, and a very good collaborator, um, was clever enough in 2004 to identify and to, 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 to understand that C1 line is a key line that uh, we can use uh, in order to, um, to measure the molecular gas in, the, in uh, galaxies. And uh, only 10 years later, um, some uh, uh, observations to develop molecular ridge clouds um, found that the C1, um, the C1 line can give as good as uh, results as CO does. So uh, we have observational proofs that these claims of uh, Padelis, uh, the early claims of Padelis, are totally, totally valid. Of course, uh, it, is it was thought to be a thin layer. Uh, that was not. Uh, that's why it was not favored uh, for uh, as an alternative tracer of H2 until we uh, found in 2015 that uh, 
we may have situations uh, that in the in the universe that the C1 um, uh, layer is not thin at all. It's actually a very thick layer. And this thickness of the layer of the C1 layer of the atomic carbon uh, is mainly connected with uh, the presence of cosmic rays. So cosmic rays are actually, as I said, relativistic uh, charged particles, and um, they are able to ionize uh, medium at high column densities to, to produce some uh, secondary phonons and uh, to actually um, ignite the chemistry at uh, high column densities. Um, the important reactions that uh, cosmic rays do is that cosmic rays interact with helium, uh, they ionize, uh, they singly ionize helium, and then this helium plus destroys very, very effectively CO, producing C plus. And then if there is, um, if, the, if the cosmic rays are not very, very strong, this C plus has very, has enough time to combine quickly with three electrons and form atomic carbon. So this is actually in very uh, few uh, words, what is happening when we increase the um, uh, cosmic rays. And uh, that means that uh, we may end up having extended regions here that although they are molecular, so whatever is below this black line is molecular gas, whatever is, is above the blue line uh, has no CO in it uh, or has, uh, has trace amounts of CO. So C1 actually dominates here. So you have higher abundances of C1. And you see that if you go to high cosmic ionization rate, so the Milky Way average is down here. So if we go 10 or 100 times, uh, the average uh, values of, uh, of cosmic rays in the Milky Way. We may go to extreme galaxies, the starburst galaxies that we have in the early universe. And so these, may, these systems may be rich in atomic carbon rather than CO, just because they have uh, very high cosmic ionization rates. And of course, uh, the cosmic ionization rate also uh, uh, produces some heat. And um, uh, you see that uh, if we go to high densities and high cosmic ionization rates, the high dense material may have um, actually different temperature. Uh, the floor temperature is not is no longer 10 Kelvin as we have in Milky Way. It may be 50 Kelvin. So 50 Kelvin. So go for, going from 10 to 50 Kelvin is not a trivial uh, difference so here. This has an, a, a tremendous effects in fragmentation of uh, material. We, we may end up having different star formation process there, uh, which can actually control also the IMF in these galaxies. But these are all uh, so far some theoretical aspects or some um, key things to keep in mind. So from now on, uh, I would move on uh, to uh, giving you some examples from our three dimensional uh, simulations. Uh, so what uh, we have been doing here is that we took um, the final snapshot of this uh, magneto hydrodynamical simulation. So uh, we have two clouds in this case where they collide here and they form a filamentary structure. And underneath we have the very same um, uh, clouds, but they do not have uh, head-on velocities, and they are just uh, uh, let let uh, um, evolve in uh, the simulation domain, and uh, pr they produce uh, some diffuse gas. Uh, so I will focus here on these two clouds, and actually two subregions. Uh, from now on, we will call them dense cloud, which is the above, and the diffuse cloud, which is uh, below. Uh, based on these uh, simulations, we have also done some further I work on cloud cloud collisions. Uh, I will not go through this at all. I would just uh, uh, like to, to draw your attention to these papers. If you're interested in cloud cloud collisions, we also have a, a Sophia press, re press release that was uh, out in uh, around 2018. Uh, nevertheless, we got these uh, two different clouds. Uh, here, uh, we post process them. Um, with uh, the 3D PDR code, which uh, was uh, the code that, uh, that uh, I developed when I was in, uh, in UCL in 2012. And uh, since then, I'm using it uh, for the last uh, 10 years very, very effectively, producing, uh, uh, still producing uh, good science, hopefully good science. Uh, so this is uh, uh, the latest uh, result out of this code. 
Um, so what I'm going to show you is the results only for, uh, for the dense clouds uh, here, just not to confuse you too much. Uh, what we have done here was to take this cloud, embed it in different ISM conditions, different FUV intensities, different cosmic ionization rates, different metallicities. We end up having 20 different simulations and then we are ready to see what the results are. So um, here in these uh, panels on uh, each column, it, uh, you can see the different environmental parameter. In this case, it is the cosmic ionization rate. So 10 to the minus 17 and 10 to the minus 16, uh, these two are found in Milky Way. Then we have 10 times the environment in the Milky Way and 100 times in the, uh, in the Milky Way. And as we go, um, in, each, in each row, we have the C plus emission, C1 emission, CO emission, and then we have the uh, column density of molecular gas and the gas temperature here. And uh, so the effect, the effect that cosmic rays uh, can do is actually that as we increase in cosmic rays, um, uh, the C plus uh, emission is getting bright and very, very bright at the end because the gas temperature here increases. We have the, the, uh, uh, we have the situation where the gas temperature goes from around 10 Kelvin to around 50 Kelvin. And that means that it is able now to emit very, very brightly in C plus while it stays in molecular uh, state. So this is also very important for, especially for extragalactic uh, uh, applications in the early universe or also observations in the galactic center because we know that in galactic center, the situation are quite extreme. So they're more close to this uh, right uh, column. Then uh, the atomic carbon uh, line here uh, progressively increases and traces the H2 uh, rich gas. So you see that uh, the uh, atomic carbon line, um, the emission of the atomic carbon line increases and stays quite bright. The uh, CO line here is uh, uh, doing uh, some nonlinear effects. So um, although we have the destruction of CO by cosmic rays, we have a situation here that um, the CO is getting back to its bright stage. And uh, I would like you to see, for instance, this region here where it becomes brighter and brighter. That's because the cosmic rays destroy the outer parts of the cloud and we are able to see further inside the cloud. So effectively, cosmic rays, what cosmic rays do is that they reduce the optical depth of CO1 to zero. Uh, another key uh, interest here is that uh, the CO abundance and, uh, and, and of course the CO emission, although it drops down here, becomes very, very dim. Uh, it goes up again quite uh, in quite a, a bright stage if you go to extreme cosmic rays. And uh, there is a route which I will not go through, but uh, we identified this route uh, uh, that this reformation of CO can happen via the OH uh, channel. Um, and we have an, an entire section of that in our uh, 2017 uh, paper. Um, the column density of molecular uh, hydrogen remains uh, unchanged as you see. So. Uh, basically, you take a cloud, you put it in different cosmic rays, you keep it molecular, but the carbon cycle changes completely. So it is also important to know that uh, because we need to know what to observe and how to observe this molecular uh, gas um, in different environments. And as I said, of course, the temperature increases everywhere. Now, if we change the environmental parameter, if we move away from cosmic rays and see what starlight does actually, um, it uh, creates C plus bright regions, but in the outer parts of the cloud, because the FUV radiation cannot go inside the clouds, so inside a high column density. So it stays out and it can make uh, C plus bright regions around uh, the high density uh, medium. Uh, a similar situation is observed for atomic uh, hydrogen, for atomic, uh, sorry, for atomic uh, carbon. And uh, the uh, CO here, as you see, this small island here vanishes completely because photons dissociate CO, they destroy completely uh, CO, and uh, it's not, it's not uh, yet, uh, it, it, it's not uh, anymore uh, observable. Um, the uh, column density of H2 remains almost unchanged in the high uh, in uh, in in this uh, case only the outer parts are destroyed and they are rich in h1 uh, and of course the gas temperature remains cold inside 
the filamentary structure, but it's quite warm outside. So uh, the difference between the cosmic rays and FUV photons is that cosmic rays can change the chemistry effectively inside at high column densities where the FUV photons are more responsive, responsible for the more of the lower column density or the outside uh, of the clouds or the skin. Uh, similar effects we have uh, with uh, metallicity. Uh, actually, uh, as we go to lower metallicities, which is the left column, so the solar metallicity is the canonical one that we have in Milky Way. If we go to the galactic center, then we have super solar metallicity, which is uh, here on the, on the right uh, column. But if we go to the outer parts of Milky Way, the outer uh, edge in the edge of the, of the galaxy, or if we go to the early universe, we have lower uh, metallicities. And it's also interesting to see how the, the carbon cycle there behaves. So we see that basically CO uh, is uh, completely destroyed, uh, completely gone in the diffuse medium because the abundance of CO has been uh, dropped uh, more than 10 times already. And in association, of course, with uh, the FUV photons, um, CO120 uh, is not observed at all in the diffuse medium, only in the dense part. Uh, and the, the other important thing is that lower metallicity means that we have also lower dust uh, abundance. So uh, if we have lower dust abundance, then uh, it means that the FUV photons can, are able to travel further inside uh, the cloud because that the primary reason of uh, the FUV, uh, of blocking the FUV is, is the dust. So if we reduce the dust, then we actually reduce this shielding and FUV photons can travel further in and they can uh, increase the, the gas temperature at high uh, column densities. And of course, this has effects on the, on, uh, the chemistry. So uh, if we combine all these uh, results now with um, the X factor, as I said earlier, or how uh, to measure the molecular uh, gas, then we end up having these results. So uh, here we have the, uh, the, the um, case where uh, we use the CO120 as the, as the uh, conversion, uh, as, as the tracer to convert uh, molecular uh, the CO emission to molecular gas to, and to measure it. The blue shaded region is the uh, average number that we use um, uh, for Milky Way studies. And you see that the uh, CO, um, the XCO factor that we find in our simulations, which are the thick dash and thick solid lines here, the light blue lines. Uh, is roughly uh, staying constant as a function of the cosmic ray energy. And uh, underneath, I have the results for the atomic carbon, and you see that we have uh, a dependence of the cosmic ionization rate as we, um, if we use the atomic carbon as, uh, as an alternative uh, tracer of um, H2. Um, and of course, uh, people are very interested also in uh, observing uh, CO, in observing molecular gas in low metallicity environments. And because the uh, CO is reduced uh, dramatically, then uh, the um, XCO uh, factor is uh, actually becoming uh, um, much, much higher than, than the average galactic uh, we find here in, the, in Milky Way. So instead of having 210 to the 20, we may end up having uh, 210 to the 22. So even two orders of magnitude difference if we go to lower environments. Um, because we have two clouds, we have a, a dense and a, and a diffuse cloud, we see here that we have a difference, a huge difference between the uh, XCO factors. So if we, uh, if we observe a dense medium in, uh, in, high, in low metallicities, we find that the XCO factor there significantly differs uh, if, um, with the corresponding one of the more diffuse medium. And this is also observationally uh, proven with uh, some observation by Andreas Schruba, uh, who observes uh, different clouds in uh, Andromeda galaxy. And they found also that in low metallic environments, uh, density matters, basically. The column density matters. And um, uh, the higher the column density, the more different XCO factor you need to, uh, to assume. Um, another important thing is the CO spectral line energy distributions. 
So uh, you see here the cloud uh, that I was showing before in the, in the CO120 transition, but what about the other transitions? So what about the two to one, three to two and so on? So you see that as we go down or as we go higher to higher uh, CO uh, transitions, um, what we see is uh, that uh, the material here, uh, we trace more and more dense material but because the uh, CO, uh, the high JCO transitions are coming from very, very dense medium, it means that it's almost impossible to see them in normal conditions. Uh, the um, energy, the upper energy level of uh, the different CO transitions is uh, shown in this, uh, in this uh, table here, where you see that in order to uh, excite CO1 to zero, all we need is like five Kelvin. If we need, if we want to, to go to two to one, we need 16 Kelvin, 33 Kelvin and so on. So we need a hotter or warmer environment in order to see more and more of these uh, CO transitions. And, uh, and uh, indeed, if we use higher cosmic ray ionization rates, we can go to high column densities. And now we are able to see those um, CO uh, transitions at higher, um, at, at higher uh, rotational levels. And if we get numbers of all these lines, so if I get one number from this uh, CO line, uh, CO1 to zero transition, another number from here and so on, we can construct these CO sleds for different uh, models. And uh, the important thing here is that only cosmic rays can do this trick where the CO sleds at high J CO transitions can go up and uh, higher and higher. We don't have this in uh, as a function of the FUV intensity. We don't have this as a function of uh, metallicity. Um, so this happens in, uh, in uh, um, GMCs, but uh, what about a more um, global scale? So if we go to a galaxy, uh, so this is what I am actually working now. So I'm currently working uh, on, uh, on a project that concerns uh, two uh, dwarf galaxies that are in a merging process. And actually you can see the uh, model here. So these are two uh, dwarf galaxies were uh, interacting. And uh, then we have uh, star formation, massive star clusters here are formed. They produce ionizing radiation. They uh, change the chemistry of the environment. And more importantly, they are uh, giving, uh, uh, they, they, they have um, significant uh, feedback in order to produce a C plus uh, line because since we have high mass uh, star formation or massive cluster star, uh, uh, massive uh, star clusters, then uh, we have the conditions in order to have the carbon in the ionizing form. So, what we have seen is that as the uh, um, Managing process evolves, so we have different time scales at 70 mega years, 160, 170, and 280 mega years. The emerging process occurs between 160 and 170, and you see here that the um, uh, the um, galaxies are coming together. We have this bar-like structure that is formed. We have the cluster formation. They produce ionizing radiation. We have bubbles uh, here, H2 region bubbles and uh, we have supernova explosions and so on. And you see here that the C plus emission, which is the, the, the middle uh, panel, the middle set of panels uh, is getting, um, is, is quite dim here, but it gets bright, very bright and stays bright also uh, here. And uh, of course the um, emission from dust, because it's an important emission that we need to always observe. To, to keep in mind and, and, and observe, they, it also uh, follows the same pattern. So we have low FIR emission, higher and higher, and it stays quite uh, high. And if we are to um, actually correlate the star formation rates, so that is the rate at which uh, stars are formed per year, um, and we, then to correlate this with uh, C plus uh, luminosity, we find that we have the same pattern. So the star formation rates as a function of the time evolution or the evolution, uh, evolutionary time of the simulation, um, the star formation rates uh, has th those three distinct peaks, peaks um, especially here in the 170 mega years where we have this huge 
um, collision and the production of uh, uh, massive star clusters. And you see here that the C plus luminosity follows the same pattern and it maximizes here in this uh, situation. So these are the results, this black red uh, curve are the results from our simulations and the observations are also showing the same thing. So these are the Deleuze uh, observation from the Duovo Galaxy Survey that uh, we have a very, very nice pattern here that, uh, that uh, follows uh, each other. Um, one of the common questions is where does this C plus emission come from? And uh, what we find in these simulations is that it is actually coming from the warm neutral medium in these uh, 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 systems. Um, another important um, thing uh, is uh, how uh, is the, the uh, well-known problem that we have in the interstellar medium of the C plus uh, deficit. So the problem is that we observe C plus emission. We also get observations of the dust. And uh, if we combine these two, some, in some cases, we have more dust emission than we expect uh, to have from the C plus uh, uh, observation. So uh, we have very bright emission of dust, but not the corresponding brightness in C plus that we expect. Therefore, the medium is called C plus deficit. And there, are, there have been proposed several mechanisms of how this C plus deficit can form uh, or the, the origin where, the, where it actually comes from. What we have seen in these simulations is that the uh, actual, the FUV radiation is very responsible for this situation. Uh, here we have uh, the snapshot where we have this massive star cluster formation that, that forms inside here. So this is the green cross. So the C plus luminosity here, as you see, it's quite bright here. We have much brighter FIR emission. And if we divide these two maps exactly where the cluster is, this C plus of FIR drops. So we have C plus deficit medium there because the FUV radiation is quite uh, bright. And we have seen uh, that also in observations, especially uh, the, by Goiko, Echea, and Pabst, the recent uh, uh, observations in Orion. So in both cases, so what Pabst did was to observe a more extended region of the Orion uh, uh, nebula. Uh, nevertheless, the outcome is the same. We have C plus emission uh, here, FIR emission here. And if, if we divide those two maps, we get the C plus over FIR. So we get very low um, numbers where the trapezium is, where we have also production of FUV photons. And this is exactly what we see also in these uh, simulations. Uh, I will skip these uh, slides here, but I would like to uh, show you on uh, on um, the what, what is the physics behind this uh, C plus deficit mechanism that can be produced from FUV radiation? So here we have an one DPDR model. Uh, on the left panel here, top left panel is the C plus emissivity. Lower left is the FIR emissivity. So we have C plus and dust. And here we have the, the gas temperature just for for reference. And here is the C plus over FIR. So this fraction. And as I increase in um, FUV intensity, uh, you see here that the C plus OFIR drops down. Um, but uh, here we have what we call the thermal saturation here, uh, which is actually, uh, which is actually uh, this effect here. The C plus emission basically, um, although we increase the FUV radiation six orders of magnitude, we have the C plus emissivity to be actually saturated to an upper value because simply C plus have nothing else to give. So if we give even 10 to the 10 G naught, we get the same C plus. So um, the emission of C plus remains the same, but the, uh, the uh, dust emissivity uh, increases almost uh, super linearly with uh, G naught. So if we get the emission of dust and uh, the emission of C plus and divide them into um, those two, then we end up having this drop of uh, C plus over FIR. So we end up having C plus deficit uh, medium. Uh, finally, on the important um, uh, correlation between the C plus and the star formation rates, because C plus is also uh, used as a star formation rate tracer. We also have very good agreement with observations. Our simulations are the, uh, the circles here, the, 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 the thick dots. 
they are color coded according to the C plus over FIR. And um, you see that as we increase in the star formation rate, which means that we increase also in, in, in C plus luminosity, the medium becomes more and more deficit. And you see here that this color corresponds to a low value, whereas here it corresponds to a higher value. Uh, our best fit, uh, uh, best fit curve is the red solid line, and the dwarf galaxy survey by the loos is the black one, which is the best uh, observational um, uh, set that we need to, to that, that we need to compare against our, uh, our simulations because we model dwarf galaxies, uh, and we have excellent agreement with observations. So we're quite uh, happy with this. This is a paper in preparation. And uh, it will soon soon uh, come online on uh, on Astro PH. Uh, just uh, um, two two sentences here, and and I end up. Um, what I'm actually working on now is uh, to uh, find a method which um, to, to construct a method which. Uh, is able to reduce a lot of the computational expense of the simulations because if we are to simulate these two uh, clouds in different environments, we need actually a lot of computational power. So uh, to simulate one cloud uh, like that in a 64 core process, uh, processor um, uh, computer requires around uh, five days of calculation. And for this paper, in the 20, 2021 paper, we used 20 different simulations like that. So we have been doing calculations for around three months. And the new method here that we develop uh, with our colleagues uh, from MPE, with Shai Yuhu, with Avina Van Dishuk, with Andrea Shruba, uh, and myself, um, we actually are able to reduce this computational cost from three months to actually three minutes. So uh, we have now a very powerful tool to do that uh, because we shouldn't only think about the ISM environmental parameters, but we also should uh, keep in mind the environment of our planets because uh, as you know, uh, uh, running heavy simulations produce also a lot of CO2 and actually there is a trend now with green astronomy uh, that, that is now these days that uh, we are talking a lot about, especially in the uh, simulation uh, groups, that uh, the heavy computational uh, simulations are actually, um, we actually need to think about these, uh, these schemes more and more. Um, I will leave you with the conclusions here. What I would like you to keep in mind from all this presentation is, is that the carbon cycle, um, and the, the emissions that we get from the different uh, species is very sensitive to the environmental parameters like the cosmic rays, FUV intensity and metallicity, but the state of, of the ISM, the molecular state of the ISM remains almost unchanged in these conditions. It changes very, very different to the carbon cycle. So it needs a, a lot of models and a, a lot of um, physics and chemistry behind to understand uh, these states and to identify to identify them with key species and uh, to do, if you want, clever tricks how to to use it to uh, use the carbon cycle in different environments. So um, here I have the papers that I went through uh, from my, my work. So I'm up for questions if you have any. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thoma. Thank you very much. Uh, we have uh, the first question by uh, Dimitra Hadzimitriou. Uh, Dimitra, please go ahead. Yes, for now. It's okay. So, <laughs> oh, I'm, yeah, sorry, yeah. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm it's sorry. Okay. No worries. No worries. Delta was correct, though. <laughs> <laughs> so, Thoma, thank you for a very, yeah. very, very interesting talk. Um, you you mentioned uh, you mentioned that um, uh, probably the, the the processes that take place uh, in uh, the earlier universe uh, in low Z environments and uh, high cosmic ray uh, environments uh, may end up uh, giving you different conditions for the fragmentation of clouds and so on mm -hmm. and therefore perhaps differences in the IMF right mm -hmm. yes. So do you, do you have from your simulations any, uh, any anything more specific about this? 
about IMF, no, I don't. Uh, we need to go this to cosmological simulations and uh, galactic scale simulations that uh, uh, are focused on these uh, on these uh, environments. Uh, this is more from the chemical point of view. Now, for uh, different IMF conditions, we have observations. Uh, we have uh, we know that uh, in the early universe we have uh, top heavy IMF through observations uh, from isotopes. Uh, but uh, when it comes to actual theoretical um, um, models for, with simulations, personally, I don't have, I am not aware of um, large scale uh, simulations that, that actually uh, control this in that extent. Keep in mind also that uh, um, when we do cosmological simulations, people are mostly focused on the hydrodynamical part and yeah. uh, we need we need to be more precise in chemistry. So yeah, exactly. this is uh, yeah. yeah. So this is actually a because problem the, the when it comes to the various you meant. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, uh, it, 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 it is actually a problem when it comes to computational astrophysics and astrochemistry because uh, uh, both of them require a lot of computational power, and if you combine the two, then you end up having a massive, massive uh, computational expense. So. Uh, codes are developed these days to solve this problem, um, but uh, unfortunately, I don't have a result uh, to mm -hmm. in mind to, to answer you. I think that this, I think this will be the big papers that will come out in the next few years uh, when these codes will be developed. Okay, thank you. I was just wondering because uh, um, some of the species you you mentioned mm -hmm. uh, that are affected by um, cosmic rays and so on. And yeah. do play a role in the cooling, right? Yes, exactly. Yes, cosmic rays are very important. You, you would expect to have a significant effect on the fact. Yes, rays. yes, cosmic rays. Cosmic rays are are actually maybe the most important uh, environmental parameter to keep in mind because uh, mm -hmm. not only they can travel at high column densities, but they can actually trigger the chemistry. If we didn't have cosmic yeah. rays, we wouldn't have we wouldn't exist basically because we wouldn't have molecules. Uh, mm -hmm. Actually, cosmic rays produce all uh, the chain of reactions uh, responsible to produce more complicated uh, uh, molecules. So, uh, yeah, this is my opinion also. Great. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Okay. Are there any other questions for Thomas? There's a question uh, from Tanio. Uh, please go ahead. Hi, Thomas. Hi. Uh, very, very nice, very nice talk. I yeah. had a couple of uh, questions. The the first is regarding the the effect of uh, cosmic rays mm -hmm. on the uh, dissociation of CO. Um, you show that uh, for the extreme uh, cosmic rays rates. Mm -hmm. uh, could uh, see more of the CO volume. Uh, you mentioned that it was because um, <clears throat> CO becomes thin, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you can see uh, deeper in the in the cloud, let's say. So mm -hmm. uh, does that mean, or how can that be translated into uh, how you transform uh, your uh, your uh, um, CO measurements into H2 measurements. Uh, okay, yeah, I can go to the slide. Uh, first of all, yeah, it's 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 this slide here where uh, actually you have less uh, CO in this environment. Then another uh, image to keep in mind is is this. So uh, you also mentioned that uh, correctly that the CO becomes brighter here. Um, and uh, then we end up having the XCO factor, which is here. And uh, what we, what we see actually, um, this is this is the the, the nonlinear part that that I was uh, trying to mention. Um, we have the destruction of CO by cosmic rays. So this the abundance of CO indeed goes down and it can go down an order of magnitude even if you are in high cosmic ionization rates uh, but the emission actually uh, does not because um, the gas temperature goes up 
and the little remaining CO there it becomes very bright. Uh, so for some reason, it just uh, the destruction of the abundance of CO compensates with uh, the emission. So you you have a reduction of CO, the, the reduction of uh, abundance of CO. You have an increase of CO brightness, and uh, it happens that the uh, CO uh, luminosity uh, as a function of the cosmic ionization rate remains actually very constant. Um, because if you go to, to these clouds, um, uh, the outer part here is completely destroyed by CO. So the medium is becoming more optically thin. And you can see a bright emission inside the cloud because here CO at high densities survive. And the emission here is stronger than when you have lower cosmic rays because here you see one level in. Um, and uh, actually, yeah, if you, if you uh, take the luminosity of the CO1 to zero, take the column density, the average column density of H2, and you take the, the ratio of the two for all those cases, uh, you end up having this uh, nearly constant uh, behavior. Um, yeah, so this is, this is actually what, what happens. I, I, I was naively expecting also before I do this radiative transfer models that because we have destruction of CO, the XCO uh, factor will be completely different at high cosmic ionization rate. So I was expecting something like that. So the opposite of, uh, of uh, metallicity. So I was expecting the, uh, the XCO to go up but indeed, uh, we have this effect of um, brightness of CO, and um, it, it, it gets it back to, to this normal number. I see. It, then, but if I understand well, uh, you you mentioned that the CO the CO intensity doesn't change because it uh, it is compensated at a lower abundance with a, a higher temperature and then emissivity. But then that doesn't, I mean, um, that doesn't, what, what one would want is to match the abundances of CO and, uh, and uh, NH2, not the intensity of the lines, right? Yes. So even if we see the same amount of CO, that's only because it's at a higher temperature. So I'm surprised there are, there is no, uh, there is no uh, such a, a larger discrepancy between the CO or let's say, let me put it in, in a different way. Mm -hmm. uh, is the interpretation of the CO to H2 or H2 to CO luminosities, uh, in this case, with high cosmic rays related to only abundance or is related to you know, the, the radiation field as well? Uh, radiation fields or the temperature. I mean, the temperature. Basically. No, yeah, the temperature. No, I think the temperature is 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 way more important than the abundance. Uh, so the actual ratio is should be more correlated with uh, the the temperature. This is what uh, we have seen uh, in the recent simulations. In the in the beginning, I was expecting to have this correlated more with abundances, as you correctly say. Uh, so the lower abundance, the less the emission. Uh, but uh, I didn't think of the of the um, cosmic ray heating that is very important. And uh, indeed, these 10 or 20 Kelvin difference that the cosmic rays give with the high density medium are extremely important, not only for CO1 to zero, but especially for the high JCO lines. Uh, these are even more affected uh, by that. So yeah, the bottom line is that the XCO factor remains constant as a function of the cosmic ionization rate, simply because the medium becomes more warm and the lower abundance of CO is compensated with the increase of, the, of its emission. That, that's how I can put it in a, in a sentence. Yeah. Okay. Um, and the other uh, question was, uh, regarding the, uh, the G plus deficit, mm -hmm. that uh, you mentioned that uh, the thermal saturation is uh, uh, 
probably a driver uh, or an important driver uh, of, uh, of why we see yeah. less uh, plus per it's, amount. Of, uh, it's one of the reasons. Amount. Yes. Yes. One of yes. the reasons. Yeah. So I was wondering because we also see uh, a deficit in the oxygen 163 micron line, mm -hmm. but that has a um, the energy between the levels, the, 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 population, the level population is uh, much higher than, the, than that of C plus, right? Uh, C plus is like 92 Kelvin and oxygen one is 220 something. Mm -hmm. uh, but we nevertheless uh, see also a deficit despite that it has a higher energy level, right? So I, I was wondering whether there is, you could, Envision a similar um, uh, uh, scenario, no? That that you they were describing in your uh, very nice talk, or like you, as you increase G naught, right? Yeah, uh, yeah, I see, I see, I see one. So if if you can reproduce also the same effect uh, in the oxygen one line, I haven't tried it uh, to be honest. Maybe this is a very good idea. Maybe we can uh, can see that in these simulations and uh, and have an idea, but. Uh, yeah, I didn't work on the oxygen yet, uh, so unfortunately I can't uh, answer this comment. But um, um, it's it's quite interesting. Yeah, to uh, I'm expecting that the FUV radiation will do a similar effect because uh, from quantum mechanics, uh, this will be at some point saturated, and the FUV radiation emits as a black body, so it has nothing to do with. Uh, with uh, stages and uh, with transitions and all of that, it's just a black body radiation. The, the more the more FUV you put, the higher the uh, emission that you get. Uh, but uh, yeah, I think that you are right that we should also see this in oxygen. I believe that you're you're quite right that. Um, now, now that you touched also the uh, uh, part of the C plus deficits, uh, what I want to mention is that, of course, there's no only the FUV radiation that may be responsible. There are at least eight different mechanisms that are proposed uh, for the C plus deficit. Uh, some of them have to do with dust, that the dust, uh, uh, that, that, that there is more dust in these environments, or uh, uh, there are different surfaces, dust surfaces and the different uh, shapes and all of that. Um, so I don't know if, whether these mechanisms can be applied to oxygen as well, uh, but uh, I think I can. I'm just thinking loudly now that uh, I should expect to see the same effect with oxygen uh, with the thermal saturation. Yeah. Yeah, that would be very interesting to. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, there was one more question by Vasilis, maybe, or not, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's not, uh, I think the time is passing. So I was just wondering quickly, uh, Thoma, if you remember from, even from way back, uh, uh, C plus uh, from the work of George Helou, maybe 20 years ago, he was suggesting that it was, uh, there was a balance between heating and cooling. So there was a very nice correlation between C plus and, uh, PAH emission, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, has anybody, have you, have, have you and the, the reason why I thought about this is because you also showed this correlation between star formation rate luminosity as a function of time and uh, C plus luminosity, if I remember mm -hmm. right. And uh, this seem, seems to work in general, but once you go to regions where you have uh, uh, massive star formation, oh, here. Uh, yeah. this may this falls right so one starts to think about the whole concept of how pdrs the whole geometry issue right the volume mm -hmm. filling factor of the photodissociation spher spherical cells and uh, what tanya for example had done in his uh, work uh, mm -hmm. where the compactness in a sense of the regions or the surface density of the thermal emission at 50 microns may play a role in uh, when we do this type of correlations. Is this something that can be modeled more carefully, you think, or, uh, uh, or, you know, or can I we, yes. can we all, the reason why I'm asking is that, you know, can we, can you, for example, come up with a, a recipe where you could say, 
uh, up until in this parameter space, it's safe to use it. If you exceed this parameter space, then maybe additional information uh, may be needed to constrain your estimates, basically on star formation rate. That's basically my suggestion. Do you think this can be done? Because otherwise, someone, yes. uh, otherwise, um, like uh, George Magnus, for example, will tell you, look, I use two different conversion factors and I, and I can estimate both the, stellar, the, the gas mass just fine. And uh, I use another tracer for my star formation rate. So why do I need to bother for C plus? You see what I mean? I could yeah, say, yeah. Uh, yeah, um, I have to think about it. I, I can't give an answer uh, now, but uh, I think that there should be a way to model this. Um, but unfortunately, I don't know right now how to do this. Um, with the tools that I have, I think that I need to do some further analysis and further coding maybe. But uh, yeah, unfortunately, I don't know that right now. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank, so, you thank you. So it's uh, it's getting late. So let's uh, thank uh, Thomas again uh, for his very nice presentation. And uh, thank you everyone for attending. Uh, have a nice uh, evening and. Uh, uh, Merry Christmas, and we'll see you with the new year. Bye, everyone. Okay. Bye. Bye. Thanks a lot, Thomas. Mm -hmm. Bye. Bye.